Numbers chapter 20, we're, we're, we're reading about the wilderness wanderings where we're, we've seen the nation of Israel, of course, be delivered from Egypt. They've come out with a mighty hand of God, 10 plagues that humbled the, the Pharaoh and the gods, the so-called gods that were worshiped in Egypt. They came out, the Lord parted the Red Sea, they passed through on dry ground. The Egyptian army came after them and the Lord closed it and destroyed the army. And then they eventually made it up to a place uh, called Kadesh Barnea, and the Lord says, let me show you what I'm going to give you. Let me show you what I promised to your father Abraham. Let me show you what I'm about to do. I've done all of these miracles. I've given you the manna. I've given you the water. I've parted the Red Sea. I've sent 10 disastrous plagues upon your enemies. Now let me show you what I'm going to do next. So 12 spies go up into the promised land to observe this. And as they look, they are amazed. They're amazed at the the fruitfulness of the land. And they come back and the report is, this land truly flows with milk and honey. It is abundant and fruitful. However, there are giants in the land. These were not metaphorical giants. These were giant giants, like Goliath giants. And um, they said, "We we we can't win. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And if we go in there, they're just going to squish us like little bugs. And so the 10 who gave the bad report persuaded the rest of the congregation to not go in. But there were two men that were full of faith. And what were their names? You got it. You, we did it eat both ways, but that's all right. So we got Caleb and Joshua, Joshua and Caleb, you got the point. And these, these men will go into the promised land. But what the Lord tells them, he says, well, listen. For the 40 days that you're, you are in the land looking at what I promised to give you, you will spend as a, a chastisement, a chastening in your, in your congregation, you will spend one year wandering around in the wilderness, not having a home, not having uh, a, a place to call your own. And so for the next 40 years, that entire older generation passed away. We are, we're coming to the end of that. And so we're going to start to see some significant leaders begin to pass away. And so I think as we read these, um, one of the things that we should see about this is um, even the leaders um, are are going to pass, except for those two that were mentioned, and the younger generation. So in chapter 20, uh, we'll read a little bit here. It says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month, And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. So we're at the end here. We're we're at the end of their wanderings. And um, we we know this. If you compare this to, uh, let's see, chapter 33, same book, Numbers Numbers 33, verse 38, um, you can get a little sense of the timing of all that's going on. So you might want to just put those two passages together, and you'll see that you're that you're at the end. So yes, even, even a Miriam. Of course, who is Miriam? Some of you maybe are, are you know, like, yeah, the name's familiar, I just can't recall. This is Moses' sister. This is the one who took him as a little baby and put him in that, that basket and floated him on over by Pharaoh's daughter. And when she, Pharaoh's daughter found the basket and the crying baby, um, she pops out of the reeds. <laughs> He says, hey, do you need some help with that baby? I, I happen to know a lady um, that might be able to nurse him for you. And so Moses went back home. And then eventually he came back into the court of Pharaoh. Well, it was Miriam is the one that, that brought him, put him in the water and stayed with him in the water until he was drawn out and um, set up the, uh, the job for mom. I'm sure it was a job that uh, Jacobed was quite happy to take on. What do you think? Probably so thrilled. And so... Miriam is, is a woman of God. She's a woman of faith from a, from a teenager. And we see her you know, showing up on the, the scenes. I mean, especially you can think of her like after the, um, the parting of the Red Sea and the worship and the celebration and the praise that, that she gives, the glory that she gives to the Lord. Now, she had her moment, right? She had a time of, of thinking that she knew better 
and challenge Moses' leadership. She had leprosy break out over her body. The, uh, Moses pleaded for her and she was restored after a few days to think about what she had done and was outside the camp, but she was brought back in. Uh, I think that kind of sounds like any faithful servant of the Lord. You have a time in your life where, you, where your life is lived for the Lord, but there might be a, a chapter here or there that you're like, yeah, I crossed a line there. That wasn't a good day. That wasn't a good maybe even season of my life. And so, you know, you, you may have moments like that. But I, what I think we need to be careful to do is not dismiss her, her entire life because of that one incident because the Lord doesn't do that to us. Do you think we ever do that to each other? We shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. But I think we need to be, you know, just looking at this, be reminded that we all are a work in progress. And so while we will not tolerate sin, we certainly will um, uh, welcome you know, all sinners and um, even those that fall away and that need to be restored. And so she does this. Like us, shortcomings. But a life lived for the glory of the Lord. She dies. We all have a certain number of days the Lord knows what they are. I have no desire to know that at all. I don't have any curiosity about that, and I don't want to know, um, and I wouldn't be told anyway. Uh, so, but we all have a certain amount of time here on the earth. That you know, the Lord has set a timer um, both for my life and this present world system. There are two timers. There's a timer on me, there's a timer on you, but there's also a timer that the Lord has set until he comes back. And we don't know, we don't know when those timers are gonna ring on on my life or on this present system. It's like the Lord has lit a fuse on both ends. And somewhere is the return of the Lord, the rapture of the church, and, and somewhere is the end of our life. And, you know, we don't know if we're closer to the rapture and that fuse is right, right there, or if it's going to be closer to when I go. The Lord knows that. But does it really matter? Should it make any difference on how we live our life? Whether we think, you know, it's going to be the rapture or it's going to be life, it shouldn't have an impact. So without regard to whether I am alive at the rapture or whether I go to be with the Lord, I need to live for Jesus. I need to live completely and totally for him. We're to be faithful servants. And yet there's gonna be some days and there's gonna be some moments where we wish we could go back and we could redo it and you know, not have to deal with the consequences of what we've done. But my prayer for my life and for my family and for you is that when we leave this earth, that we will be found leaning into like a a runner, right? It's just stretched out. The head is going out. The arms are back. The chest is forward to try and get across the finish line. That it it doesn't matter how we live life. We want to finish strong, running for the Lord. And I think there is a real temptation that we all have to deal with is that we continue to press forward and not ease up and not begin to coast, to not think that I've done enough, I've, I've ran enough, I've, I've, I've given enough, I've served enough, I've prayed enough, I've witnessed enough, I have said no to sin enough. And, and the answer is you have not, nor have any of us. And so we will have a day like Miriam when we will go and be with the Lord, whether it be through the rapture or whether it be through natural causes. But when we're there, I want to be found with my head leaning forward, coming across the finish line, and seeing the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, we have, I, I think of um, when our, our daughters were running co- uh, cross country, and um, you know, uh, they, would, they would run hard. And um, you know, but when you would go to those cross country uh, meets, you would always see some um, and we would try to position ourselves at different places. And so you could see some, some kids that would take off running like in a, in a wind sprint. And um, you, you knew what was going to happen. And so you would get up there and they would come around the turn and they would go into the woods and all of a sudden they would start walking. 
And then you'd have those that kind of were trained and just were like, I, we, we, we're going to finish this race. They, they weren't running wind sprint. You know, they were just, they were, they were in a pack, they were together. And then just as the race went on, they would get further and further. And then, um, you know, then at the end of the race, you would have those that had trained well, ran hard, and, and just kept their heads down and just continue to press through the race. And they would be, of course, the first ones that would, would come in. But you know the ones that started out with the wind sprint at the uh, beginning, they would often be the last. And you know what they would do the last 20 yards? They'd run super fast again, and they were last. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that. I don't, I don't want to have the one that just has a burst of energy here and a burst of energy there. You know, we want to be those that, that run well, and I think you can put Miriam into that category. Nah, she wasn't perfect, but are any of us? There's only one that's ran well perfectly, and, and that's our Lord and Savior. So if you have felt like it's time to ease up, I deserve it. I deserve to ease up. Do you really? You got a Bible verse for that? Do you have, I mean, you deserve, what do you mean you deserve to, to not run hard for Jesus Christ? Well, I've done it for so long. You're supposed to do it your whole life. And then into eternity, we're going to continue to run for the purposes and the causes of Christ. We signed up for an eternity of serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, um, yeah, if that is a thought in your mind at all, I pray the Lord would just, you know, jettison, jettison it from your mind. And that you will say, I don't care what anybody else does around me. I'm going to run hard. And by I don't care, I mean, I'm not going to let somebody else's unfaithfulness cause me to not run hard. Jesus put it like this. If you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. And so, it, yeah, we live as those that are losing our life for the purposes and the cause of the Lord. So um, maybe you began that way. Maybe you started off with the wind sprint, and you had a wind sprint, and you ran fast, and ran, but you're in the woods, and you're, just, you're, you know, you're walking. You got the hill. You're walking. You Maybe even sitting on a log right now. I don't know. But you need to get up, and you need to just follow Jesus hard. So Miriam, not, not a whole lot there um, about her life, but enough that we can, you know, we can look back and say, you know, good job, Miriam. You, know, you lived a good life for the Lord and for his purposes. So we move into verse two through six. We come to a significant moment in the life of Aaron and Moses. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, if only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Oh, you wanted to go be swallowed up in the earth like Korah? Sure you did. Why have you brought us, uh, brought up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt? And if you could picture Moses, Moses has his hands in his face, just shaking his head like, I cannot believe we are doing this again. Why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us up to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now everything on Aaron and Moses' part is going well so far. They go to the Lord. They take the complaint to the Lord. But this is the thing that's interesting to me. You're mad because you don't have figs? You're mad because you don't have grapes? You're mad because you don't have streams of water flowing? And why is that that you don't have that? Can anybody, just the thought come to mind. You know, Kadesh Barnea, 12 people went into the land, 10 came back and said, don't go, and you all rebel. I mean, that's what I would have done. I would have been thinking, but nobody seems to have this thought. It's interesting how we can hear the word of the Lord so clearly, disobey the Lord so completely, and then blame him for the consequences of our sinful disobedience. 
You're like, well, not me. Uh, I, I bet you have. Just give a little thought to it. You pro- I, this is something that comes so natural to us. But really, the spirit-filled man or woman, upon f- making that mistake and, and erring and, you know, not doing what the Lord has called us to do, whether it's sin of omission or commission, recognizes that I, I'm, I'm dealing with the, cha- the chastening hand of the Lord upon me. The answer is to not you know, further rebel against him and contend with him and gripe against him. My answer, I mean, what they should have done is they should have fallen on their faces and said, oh Lord God, you wanted to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. You wanted to give us the best that there is, but we refused, we obeyed, and we chose our own ways. We lacked faith, and here we are in this place. Have mercy upon us, oh God. That's what the prayer should have sounded like. But instead, it's like, Moses, you brought us here to kill us. <laughs> it's like, you people. So they're, they're feeling overwhelmed. What should we say? How should we respond? And by the way, that, that prayer that I just kind of modeled, maybe that's a prayer that you might want to model if you're in that season of your life. If you've walked away from the Lord and the hand of the Lord is against you, well, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so if you're experiencing the chastening hand of the Lord, come back to him. Repent of what you've done. Um, But really, to be in sin and rebellion against the Lord and then to be upset that you're experiencing the consequences of being in sin and rebellion against the Lord doesn't make a lot of sense. So verse 7, we're reading that they they go. um, The Lord's going to speak to them. Uh, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you... And your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes. That's a very important line right there. Important word, speak to the rock before their eyes. Now remember, they've had a problem like this before where they didn't have water. And God instructed Moses to take the rod and what? Strike Strike the rock. And water came forth. Now he's supposed to take his rod, but he's supposed to speak to the rock. And it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give them drink. uh, And give drink to the congregation and their animals. This was going to be, I mean, you got two million people with animals. This was going to be quite a gusher. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, everything's good so far. But then he says, hear now you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod and water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord. They contended with Yahweh, and he was held among them. So, they, I mean, they didn't handle the situation right, the congregation. Moses and Aaron handle it right. They go to the tabernacle of meeting. They hear the voice of the Lord. They grab the rock, uh, the rod. Everything's going well until they decide to take matters into their own hands. And he misrepresents God to the people. That, this is the error. He misrepresents God to the people. He takes glory to himself. Must we bring water from the rock? Really, Moses? You think you can do that on your own? You think you have the ability to strike a rock without the favor and kindness of God and his miracle, and you're going to be able to give all of these people? And so, you know, this is... I, you know, you look at it, you're like, oh, that, he should not have done that. And yet probably all of us have been frustrated at least once or twice in our life, a day. And, and know what it's like to, to sin in this manner and to get angry and to misrepresent the heart and the mind of the Lord to those that are around us. Moses could do nothing apart from the Lord. 
He was a fugitive on the run, hiding on the backside of the desert from the Pharaoh. And the Lord raised him up from that spot and began to use him in a mighty way. We're going to see that the, the Lord is going to refer to this act by Moses and, Re, and, and Aaron as rebellion. So what is it that they said? You what? You rebels. But when the Lord brings charge against them, and we'll read it in just a little bit, he's going to say because of your rebellion. They rebelled against the ways of the Lord. I think you could probably say in one sense, well, okay, speak to the rock, smite the rock. Is it really that big of a deal? Evidently it was. <laughs> it kept them out of the promised land. This is something that God wanted done in a particular way. And they disobeyed. The other piece that I believe we have here that the Lord found so offensive in this is that Moses marred a typological picture. Do you know what I'm referring to? Second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Jesus is the rock. How many times was Jesus smitten? Once, Once for all. He never was going to be, you know, beaten and crucified again. So look at this, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant, uh, be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all ate the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So this was a picture. The water that they, they received was a picture. In um, John chapter 4, um, John chapter 7, I think as well, um, you, you have Jesus picturing um, himself. At the, at the feast, they would, in celebrating the wilderness wanderings, um, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, they would remember the wilderness wanderings. And one of the things that they would do is they would go down to the pool of Siloam, and they, so those of you that are about to go to Israel, keep this in mind. They go down to the pool of Siloam and they bring the water up to um, the temple. It's, it's a hike. And they would bring this water out and they would pour this water out onto the stony pavement. And it was to symbolize how water came from the rock. And when Jesus is there in that scene, and it was, it was significant, okay? So Jesus is the rock, right? And he, this is the rock that water came from. They are commemorating the event when the water came from the rock and Jesus is there with them and he says to them, hey, if you're thirsty, what? Come to me. I'll give you something to drink. And so Jesus assumes even that typological picture that, is, that was being established in the Old Testament um, and he takes it to himself. So I think part of the problem was that they rebelled against the Lord in his ways. They misrepresented the Lord to uh, the children of Israel and he messed up the picture that, G, that the Lord was painting. Now it was only a picture, it was only a foreshadowing, I mean, right? It's, it's, it's a typological picture. But this idea that Jesus would be struck twice is I mean, how would, what would, if somebody was to come and tell you, well, you know, actually, we found a missing document, and in this document, we find out that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, was crucified again. Yeah. You would, you would immediately dismiss that from your mind, and it would be so offensive to you to think that Jesus Christ would be crucified over and over. And, of course, here in the book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings, it's a point that's, that's being driven home in a big way. So let me, you know, I'm gonna see if I can find this verse real quick. Yeah, turn with me over to John chapter seven. I just wanna read that. 
that scene of the, the Feast of, Tabernac- of, of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles there in John 7. John 7, verse 37. On the last day, that, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, is Jesus glorified today? Yes, Yes, he is. So the spirit has been given. So guess what? There is for you this uh, the ability to be satiated in the spirit to have this living water um, from your life because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. So, I mean, this... This, this rock, this picture of the water, I mean, it kind of just, it, you have, it's a picture of Christ, and then when Jesus talks about it, it says, hey, you come to me, and once you come to me, I am that rock, I'll, I'll, I'll quench your thirst. You're gonna have living water, and the Spirit is going to give this to you. And so if you are a believer, then you have the, you have the presence of the Spirit of God dwelling within you, so what I wanna ask you is, do you, are you satiated? You know, after the water came out of this rock, the animals and the people were satisfied. You've come to Christ and you've received him as your Lord and Savior. Are you satisfied? And if you're like, well, I don't know. Well, listen, that is not a judgment of Jesus. That's a judgment of how you're receiving Jesus in your life. I don't, I don't know what's wrong I don't know what happened in your life that you could come to Christ and have the spirit of the living God dwelling in you and not be satisfied. But if I was you, I would go find out fast. I would get on my face before the Lord and say, what is it, Lord? What, how is it that you, the creator of the universe, could dwell within me and yet I somehow could not be quenched? That I'm still so thirsty And my advice to you is to seek the face of the Lord and to come back to the Lord and look to no one else but Jesus and him alone. Isn't it interesting, getting back to the story there in chapter 20, isn't it interesting, and it stands as a warning to us, that Moses sinned in the area of his greatest strength. What what is the commentary that God gave of Moses that he was the something of all people, meekest, the most humble man. And yet here in this scene, it's anything but humility. It's pride, it's arrogance. You rebels, must we do this for you? And smack the rock and disobey the Lord. For theatrics, I don't know what it was for. But it is a warning to us. If you have an area of strength, you must pay attention Take heed to that in your life as well. Somebody once said, I don't know who first said it, but it's a, um, an unguarded strength becomes a double weakness. And so this is that moment for him. And it's, it's going to have significant consequences. Um, so he strikes the rock and then in verse 11, then Moses lifted his hand, struck the rock. The Lord comes to him and he says, all right, you didn't believe me. You didn't hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so um, this is a big deal. Therefore, you should not bring this assembly into the land. Can you imagine how his heart must have sank? What? <laughs> okay, Lord. And you're like, wow, that seems a little, this seems a little strict. Well, James 3.1 says, my brethren, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So there should be a sobriety to all, hopefully in my life, in all of our lives, especially for those who stand to teach and to lead God's people. There is a greater answering that has to be given. Moses, representing the law, is not going to take the children of Israel into God's rest. So you got a little picture there as well. Now listen, I, you know, it's because of his sin that he doesn't do that. 
I won't make it a typological picture, but it is something to, to, to ponder. But, you know, he, he fails in this way, um, and what a big deal it was. And so let, may we all be warned in our hearts and, and in our lives to walk faithfully. So verse 14 through 21, um, they're going to keep on moving, and uh, they're going to come to uh, the border of Edom. Edom, this is a nation who is descended from Esau. Remember, Jacob, the nation of Israel, and Esau, the nation of Edom. Their family, um, ancient family, but their family. And uh, so they're, they're, they're coming, and they're about, they're, again, they're going into the promised land. Moses is still leading them. Um, they haven't come into the land yet, but there is, he, so he's still leading. Um, and he comes and says, hey, we want to pass through. Verse 17, please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will, uh, will we drink water from wells. We've got this kind of cool thing that travels along with us. We're okay. We can get water anytime we want. Uh, we will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we've passed through your territory. Then Edom, verse 18, said to him, you shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway, and if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away. Can you put that map up there? Oh, how well can you see that? That's gonna be hard. You're not gonna be able to see that. But, so you have the map. Of course, you got the Mediterranean Sea uh, on the left. You have these two bodies of water at the top is the Sea of Galilee. Right at the bottom, um, I mean, sorry, is the Dead Sea. And then right at the bottom of this map is the Red Sea. And you have, if you're looking at this map, coming up the, the right-hand side of the map, that's the king's highway, and Edom would be here, and so they were wanting to come up this way. Um, and this was a major trade route. If you go along the Mediterranean, it was called the Coastal Highway. Now, co highway, Chisholm Trail, okay? Think of that, all right? The Appalachian Trail. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, um, Interstate 81 with rest stops, okay? We're, we're talking about, and I'm sure you know that, but th these are places in the wilderness, but there's also kind of going up right through the middle from uh, the Red Sea, kind of going straight up to the body of, of, of water, is called the Way of the Red Sea. And that's what they're going to have to end up doing. But what appears to have happened, um, in, in just following the geography of this, is like they're at Kadesh Barnea, and they kind of come down like this. They want to go and pick up the you know, King's Highway. They say, no, they've got to come back around. And so it's this kind of circuitous uh, route, I can't say that word, um, that is keeping them out of um, the land of Edom. And this is going to become, this is going to become another point of frustration. But that's what's going on. Uh, Dr. Wilmington says this added about 180 miles into a hot and hostile desert. That's a big deal if you're walking it, right? I mean, I wouldn't want to do that even in my car. You go an extra 180 miles but if you're on foot, this is a big deal. So they, they have to take this route, and they're just they're traveling around in this manner. Well, they don't want to fight, right? They're, they don't want to get into it with uh, their, their family, so to speak. So he says, all right, we won't go this way. Um, verse 22, now the children of Israel, the whole congregation journeyed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor, which we don't know exactly where that is. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, we know it's by the border of Edom, right? Saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he should not enter the land which I gave to the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah, striking the rock twice. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up to Mount Hor. And strip Aaron of his garments, his priestly garments, and put them on Eleazar. He is now the high priest. For Aaron shall be gathered to his people and die there. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded. And they went up 
to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar, his son. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. Now when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, all the house of Israel mourned for 30 days. So just like Moses, Aaron is kept from, and his rebellion keeps him from entering into the promised land. And so strong lessons for us to walk faithfully, to walk obediently, to, to walk into. Now, I don't think you read into this, you know, he doesn't have, he's not going to be in heaven. I think he certainly will be in heaven. But, you know, there are things the Lord had intended for him, for Moses, and they're going to miss out on it. There's something that was intended for a whole generation, um, and they all missed out on it because of their disobedience, because of their lack of faith. And so it's a warning to us. These things are written for our learning and for our admonition. Into chapter 21, they keep on moving, and here they come into a conflict with um, uh, Arad uh, and the Canaanites. So they're, they're going to just go straight up. You can put up that map again. They're just going from that, that body of water in the south. They're going straight up uh, towards the, the Dead Sea. Before they get to the Dead Sea, they're going to hang a sharp right, and they're going to come across, um, bypassing Edom. But somewhere up where they're about to make that, that sharp right turn, um, that's where you have a rod and that the Canaanites come out to fight. It, uh, this is about 20 miles north of Beersheba. So if you look on some of your maps in the back, you'll get a sense and this is an aggressive move. Um, he comes out to fight them um, and to uh, attack them. So the king of Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road of Athiram. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of the place was called Horma or destruction. So they, this is their first uh, conquest of those uh, in the land um, and they really weren't looking for it. But you got a, a, this huge massive army marching towards you and so you're gonna see kings and kingdoms come out against them. It proves to be quite costly. Look at verse four. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. So they wanted to go on the king's highway? No. So they have to go by the way of the Red Sea, which is that route that goes straight up through the middle. To go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Why? 180 extra miles. That's why. I'm sure there were other things that were factoring into it, but we're given specifics of their travel route. I think that probably contextually kind of helps us to understand. So they're discouraged. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness where there's no food and no water? Our soul loathes this worthless bread. The worthless bread was God's provision. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Ah, confession. That's a good thing. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had been anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it's an interesting story, but this, this bronze serpent is put up on a pole, and all who look to it, will be healed. The complainers, verse six, chapter 21, verse six, were bitten by poisonous snake, and as a result, they, uh, as a result of their grumbling, because they were whiners, complainers, grumblers, they got bitten, they got toxic, right? You see, I mean, can you see this? They became those that, um, they were dying, 
And I, I think there is a, a parallel that happens when we walk in the spirit of complaint and discouragement and grumbling. Does it make you feel good? Don't raise your hand. You don't have to respond. Does it make you feel good when you complain and you want? And listen, I'm not, I'm not pretending like I wouldn't have been bitten by a snake, okay? I've been bitten by this, this, this snake a lot. So com- complaining and grumbling, when you're done, do you like, ah, that felt really good. And you never feel good about it. It just stirs everything up inside of you. And you're not being literally bitten by a serpent, which they were, and you're not really dying from the toxins of that serpent, but um, they were. And, and I think we just gotta be a people of faith, a people of praise. Why discouragement? A lack of faith. Shouldn't they believe that God would provide for them? A lack of rejoicing. Lord, thank you for everything you've done before. Thank you for your provision in the past. Twice from a rock, Lord. You can do this. Once the waters were bitter and we threw a a, a, a piece of wood in there and it became sweet. Lord, you can do this. Lord, show up. It's amazing how quickly we forget the past works of God. And rather than call out upon him, we complain. And we see how the Lord feels about that. Rejoicing may not change the difficulties, but it certainly will change us and how we deal with the problem and our outlook in the problem. Guard your heart. So verse seven, they confess their sin. Moses prays for them as requested, and then he's given instruction. You know, make a a serpent, put it on a pole, and when they look to it, they will be healed. Each person had to look to the healing that the Lord was providing in the brass serpent. You couldn't look for your wife and your wife couldn't look for your children. You had to look, and isn't this true in Christ? Nobody is born according to the will of man. If people could be born again according to the will of man, there would not be any unsaved children because the will of mom and dad and grandma and grandpa is for them to be saved. But people aren't saved by the will of, of man. They, they've got to make that confession of the Lord themselves. Isaiah 45, 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. That's, that's a pretty clear verse. You know, people are like, well, that's your interpretation. Well, interpret that verse. I don't think you're gonna have to even pull out a, a dictionary for this one. It's, it's pretty, it's a pretty simple verse. There is salvation and no other one but God because there is no other God. And so we must look to him. And the provision that he makes today in the wilderness for this physical thing that was afflicting them, they had to look to the bronze serpent. Well, here's an interesting thing about this bronze serpent. Um, they do look and the cure comes. But in Hezekiah's reign, many years later, hundreds of years later, they still had possession of this bronze serpent. And guess what they were doing? They were worshiping it. And um, 2 Kings 18.4, he, Hezekiah, removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Well, that's got to be a very meaningful word, right? Nehushtan? Yeah, this is what it means. Thing of brass. <laughs> that's, that's, what they, that's what they were doing. The thing of brass. So we read here um, that he, he destroyed this, right? He broke it into pieces. Well, tradition, and I personally don't think it's true, but the tradition, just to show you how stubborn our hearts are, says that someone picked up all the pieces, glued it back together, and now today you can go to St. Ambrose Cathedral in Italy and you can see the serpent, and here's an image of it. Um, if you got that next, there. and so you, yeah, they've got it. And you know what you find people doing there? Praying to it. It's like, 
I'm not, I don't think it actually is, but it really doesn't even matter, does it? But they're, they're praying to it, and, and that is not the point. How about the, here's the point. John 3, 14, Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Not on a pole, but on a tree. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The point is, Jesus was a rock, but Jesus is also symbolized in that brass serpent. And they should have recognized this, but they didn't. And so Jesus says, I'm the one that's gonna give life. I'm the one that's going to break the curse of the serpent. I'm the one that's gonna give you deliverance from the, this, this serpent. I mean, it's, it's kind of powerful when you start to contemplate you know, what happened in the garden, what happens out in the wilderness, and then what happens with Jesus upon the cross, the seed who came to crush the head of the serpent. So listen, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Put your faith and your trust in him. Why is it that we seem to be so quick to venerate things and people and then do it again and again and again. Why, why is that? I think on, one, on the one very simple explanation, you can see them, you can see it. I think maybe that's part of it. But the real issue is idolatry thrives when worship is not in my life. You, you want to be careful? I want to be careful to never get engaged in idolatry? Then here it is. Make certain that your life is full of the worship of the true living God. Now, as soon as that is gone and you begin to miss out on the fullness and the blessing and the richness and the joy and the abundance of that relationship with God, now void comes into your life. And unless you go back to the Lord, you're going to look for things around you, and you can become so desperate that it might even be a thing of brass. And that's where the affection goes. How tragic it is. Well, they are delivered, they are healed. The rest of this chapter, um, verses 10 all the way down to verse 20. No, down to verse 35. Um, two, two big battles happen, um, and... Uh, you have a battle. If you put up this next map, um, that's going to happen. Well, actually, actually, go to the next one. I'm sorry. This this map here, um, where you can see those boxes. You in, in this view, you have the Dead Sea, and then you have the Sea of Galilee. You have those two gray boxes. The 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 southern box is where uh, King Sihon and Heshbon is going to be defeated, and then up to the north, um, you have the king King Og. Of Bashan, he is going to be defeated. And so they're beginning to have these victories now as they press forward. And, and the Lord is, is there, and they're rolling. The Lord is blessing them. Um, but as you get into these next chapters, which I'm not going to do right now, but in chapters 22 through 25, this is all about uh, King Balak of Moab coming after the children of Israel um, and trying to use Balaam to bring the curses. Remember? And so you have this um, dumb prophet that's going to be schooled by a very wise donkey. And, um, and don't think that there's not some intended irony in that. And there definitely is. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of that. So they're just making their way up. And as, as they've had some victories, or king of Arad, king um, uh, of uh, Og, and king uh, of Sihon, these victories... Everybody's taking notice. You, you can not. They didn't have internet, but everybody knew when the dust cloud of two million people was moving. And so the nations around are taking notice and they're coming out to fight them and to try and stop them. And the Lord is doing exactly what he would say, said he would do 40 years earlier. And that is, I'm gonna give you victory. You know, the book of Hebrews talks about the great sin and rebellion of Israel 
And we talked about this before, and the great sin and rebellion of Israel is they did not believe that God would give them the promised land. Now here's the next generation. They're going, they're engaging in the battles, they're believing, they're trusting in the Lord for the victory. And they're gonna go into the promised land. They're gonna go in without Moses, they're gonna go in without Aaron. Caleb, Joshua will lead them. You know, maybe you're looking at your life and you say, I don't know. I, I don't, I mean, I see people around me and they seem to be entering in. They seem to be having blessing. They seem to be uh, flourishing, but not me. Maybe I'm just not one that's intended to go into the fullness of the Lord. That is not true. The Lord is intended for all of us to enjoy the fullness of his blessings. And you know where all those blessings start, don't you? It starts at the cross. It's coming to him and it's confessing. Isn't that what they did? They confessed. We have sinned. And so if you've never come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then just as we read in John 3, put your faith and trust in him. Confess your sin. You're not so different than us. We all have done that same thing. Confess your sin to the Lord. Let him forgive you. Look at that one that was hung upon the tree. Don't look at the brass serpent. That was only a picture of what was to come. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and how he has given us that victory. And he gives us that healing, that spiritual healing, that we might know the fullness and the blessing of all that the Lord has. Let's pray. Father, we are, are grateful for your kindness and for your love. We love the way you've put this book together, Lord. It is so rich. It is so full. We can read of these ancient people wandering around, getting in trouble with snakes, and yet it is highly significant foreshadowing the life and the forgiveness and the grace that would be shown to us if we would just look to your son, Jesus. And Lord, we do look to him. We do look to him.